Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a writer, podcaster, and video maker whose work focuses on pop culture and issues of particular interest to the LGBTQ community. His popular online YouTube series, Culture Cruise, explores surprising behind the scenes stories from film and television history. And his podcast interview show, The Sewers of Paris, is about how queer people's lives are shaped by our favorite books, movies, music, and shows. He's also known for his shows Weekly Debrief and Marriage News Watch. And he's the co-creator of the comedy podcast and live show Queens of Adventure. His first book, entitled Defining Marriage, Voices from a 40-Year Labor of Love, chronicles the compelling personal stories of the most prominent pioneers and champions who fought for the legalization of same-sex marriage. And today, he's here to talk about his brand new book entitled Hi Honey, I'm Homo, Sitcoms, Specials, and the Queering of American Culture. The book gives us an informative and entertaining analysis of how, starting in the early 70s, situation comedies like All in the Family, Soap, Barney Miller, Cheers, The Golden Girls, and many more American TV shows used comedy as a medium to deliver provocative and progressive messages and lessons about bigotry, tolerance, and sexuality. From the hidden and subtle metaphors in Bewitched to the studio politics on shows like Ellen DeGeneres' sitcom and Friends to the groundbreaking triumphant victories on Will and Grace and Modern Family, the book shows us that positive media depictions of minorities on TV shows have a demonstrable real life impact in shaping public attitudes, fostering tolerance, acceptance, and empathy. Our guest was nominated for a GLAAD Award for Journalism, and his work has appeared in dozens of media outlets, including National Public Radio, Rolling Stone, The Advocate, and many more. The New York Times referred to his work as thoughtful, thorough, informative, and funny. And I agree wholeheartedly. I'm delighted to welcome Matt Baum to our show. Matt, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Matt, you described yourself as an anxious, closeted kid living in a small Connecticut suburb in the mid-90s when you discovered reruns of Soap on Comedy Central. And that triggered your fascination with primetime comedy shows as a way of shaping public attitudes. Tell me what made you write the book. Yeah, well, that's pretty much it. So when I was a teenager, Soap came on in reruns on, on Comedy Central, and I was really struck by this show that was premiered before I was born, just a little bit before I was born, tackling, you know, LGBTQ issues, although they didn't call it that then, in a way that felt very modern and contemporary to me, you know, still in the 90s, this would have been probably 94, 95, maybe. It was not something that you saw a ton of on television, and I was just starting to come to some realization or recognition uh, for myself that, that, that that's who I am. And so that that started my interest in maybe there are people like me, maybe there are stories that relate to me, maybe I can understand myself through these through these shows. And then, you know, years, years go by. Uh, I went to film school, I uh, studied mass media and pop culture. Uh, it became a real interest for me. Uh, I worked in the entertainment industry. I worked at the Jim Henson Company and Lucasfilm and uh, some other uh, other places like that. And a couple of years ago, I really started getting more interested in the history of shows, you know, that had always been a part of my life, you know, Golden Girls and Designing Women, Star Trek, and just all the pieces of media and culture that I kept finding little little breadcrumbs of uh, LGBTQ history in, and also, you know, found that those shows and movies were ways to relate to other people. I started to get more and more interested in them and looking into the making of them and what went into getting these, at the time, controversial topics on the air in front of audiences. And that turned into a real project for me of creating YouTube videos about it and then becoming more and more of an expert on the, the behind the scenes stories and, and how all these shows related to each other and to the real life story of queer liberation uh, that is reflected, uh, sometimes somewhat invisibly. You, you know, you wouldn't know to look at, for example, Seinfeld or the Golden Girls and be like, oh, oh, OK, this this show is revealing queer liberation through its its silly little sitcom jokes. But there actually is a much more important truth behind behind the comedy. 
I want to start by asking you about Bewitched, which was one of my favorite sitcoms as a kid. I'm quite a bit older than you. You wrote that the show had a gay undercurrent. What did you mean by that? What's so interesting about Bewitched is that ostensibly it's a show about a heterosexual couple. Darren and Samantha are very much, very intentionally uh, trying to blend in as the most normal nuclear couple on the block. And, and yet somehow it, it keeps going wrong, keeps going haywire. But there's also a lot of there's a lot in that show that appeals not just, I think, to queer audiences, but to people who feel marginalized on a lot of different axes. Certainly, there is a lot of very specifically queer content in terms of the effervescence of Paul Lind. Other actors like uh, Maurice Evans, who did not really speak about his personal life, but was was known by people um, 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 around him to have been gay. There's also Dick Sargent, who played the second Darren, uh, also, you know, came out much later in life, but was also gay. So anyway, you know, there's this spirit in the show of the outsider being simultaneously working on fitting into larger society, being accepted by larger society, you know, on the show, they're witches, and it's a it's a very fun metaphor. But also, you know, they're, they're these people who are, are trying to fit in, uh, but also retaining some aspect of the thing that sets them apart that makes them special. There's an early episode of Bewitched called The Witches Are Out, where Samantha and some of her witch friends feel dismayed about the way that witches are portrayed by mass media. Uh, they see, you know, Halloween is coming up, and they're like, oh, they're going to have those you know, stereotypical pictures of witches with warts chasing children. They look so ugly. Uh, one of the witches, one of the witch characters says, well, why don't we just come out and tell them that we're witches and they'll see what lovely people we are. Uh, and they wind up picketing. They wind up holding signs that, you know, witches are people too. That really closely mirrors the early queer liberation protests that were going on at the time. I think that would have been around 66 or so. You know, it was just just as you were starting to see a lot more visibility and prominence for LGBTQ issues uh, in life. You know, also, it would have been appealing. The show has something to say about people with disabilities, uh, people who are religious and ethnic minorities. It's a show that was very sensitive to folks in American society who were outsiders who just didn't see themselves depicted. So, yeah, you you know, for Bewitched, a show like Bewitched, to have a conversation where Samantha literally says the words to Darren, her husband, an ad executive, about, don't you see those stereotypes hurt us? W what an incredible thing for someone to say on a show that, you know, you, you turn on because it's light, fluffy entertainment. But there's, you know, this, this is why I think sitcoms are so important. They're enjoyable, they're accessible, and yet there's a little message in there that, that sticks with you. Yeah, for sure, if they're well-written. And one of the best, of course is all in the family. It is widely credited with making history for its groundbreaking and shocking approach to significant social issues. The show tackled homosexuality a number of times using a recurring character, a drag queen who ends up being killed in a gay bashing attack. And of course, there's the extremely powerful episode in season eight involving cousin Liz, who's in a lesbian relationship. How much credit should we give Archie Bunker for helping the bigots of the world soften their attitudes about gay people? That's a great question. I, I think All in the Family, if, if credit is due, it's to a lot of people. I think the character of Archie is incredibly important to television, but I really want to give props to Norman Lear and the all, the cast and the writers uh, who took such a bold stance. I mean, what they were doing in the early 70s was so brave to tackle issues like, you know, not just homosexuality, but sexual autonomy and race and religion and the war. Uh, it, there's so much stuff on that show that would have seemed impossible, impossible for networks to, to touch just a few years earlier. And in fact, they didn't want to. Uh, ABC famously passed on All in the Family, said there's no way we could put this on television. And then CBS gets it and, uh, you know, I'll, we'll, we'll show you. But anyway, so All in the Family, I mean, the importance of that show cannot be overstated. Also, it just that it's so well written. It's not just a show that was very important week to week, but it's such great drama, so beautifully acted, with such a perfectly cast ensemble. Uh, and then the episodes that you were talking about, the the character of Beverly LaSalle, who is a character who I actually was very fortunate that I was able to get to talk to Norman Lear. I interviewed Norman Lear for my book, Hi Honey, I'm Homo, uh, about the character of Beverly LaSalle. She is a drag queen who 
comes into the Bunker family's lives accidentally, but then they become very close. They become friends over the course of three seasons. It's remarkable. Uh, you know, she starts off as, as so much a, an outsider and a mystery and something that seems very exotic to Archie. And then over time, he softens. He becomes very close to this person who initially he is, you know, disgusted by. And then... He, Edith is very friendly with her. The, the kids are very friendly with her. And gradually, Beverly becomes a part of the family. She becomes very close to them. Uh, and the episode where she she passes away in a, in a violent attack is so incredibly moving. Uh, it, you know, Maureen Stapleton's just doing a phenomenal performance in that episode, you know, expressing the Edith's grief. Uh, so uh, Jean Stapleton. And so Anyway, the, the the show's the show's importance, all in the family's importance, just can't be overstated in in making these things not just palatable and possible to broach, but also popular for 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 you know proving that this is something that Americans were were ready for. And of course, there were other shows going on at the time, you know, like Barney Miller that that were also very brave. The cousin Liz episode was broadcast the night before the population of California voted on the infamous Briggs Initiative which would have banned gays and lesbians from working as teachers, counselors, and school administrators. The initiative was defeated, and many people cited All in the Family as influencing the vote. Do you agree that that's what happened? It's so hard to say, you know, with confidence, but I can't imagine that it didn't have an impact. So what, basically what was happening there is they, All in the Family, broadcast this episode where the bunkers encounter a lesbian school teacher that's not a huge part of the episode but it's a detail that's mentioned and in fact that she it's it's mentioned that she could lose her job if it's revealed if if she's publicly outed and she's presented as such a nice person so kind uh, in fact edith defends her when archie says you know god's sitting up in judgment and edith responds yeah but he's god you ain't and it's such a beautiful moment where she's saying you know it's not up for us to to judge people like this anyway so that episode was broadcast uh, a year before the vote and then it was rebroadcast the night before in rerun and the vote was in California whether people who are just accused of being gay or lesbian or you know in the parlance of the time whatever however people would have referred to it because the the language back then was not as enlightened as what we might use today the the measure that was under up for consideration in California would have essentially blocked queer people from holding jobs in schools and seeing a character who is so admirable on television and all, on a very popular show uh, and also a, a defense of that person, uh, somebody saying it's it's not up for us to judge. And, and, you know, how how could Edith says, I can't believe you would be so mean. I mean, Im imagine hearing those words echoing in your head when you go to the ballot box to, to vote on this thing. And also, of course, a lot of credit is due to the activists who are on the ground and Harvey Milk, who is very active in that kind of stuff. But uh, I, I think all of this, all of these little pieces play a role. And I think mass media in particular, broadcast television, especially then, obviously times are very different now, but especially then when you had a limited number of television networks, the effect of seeing stories on television on, on the American public, I mean, you, you just you can't argue that it must have had some effect. Do you think that comedies were a good way to introduce characters on TV because comedy is a less threatening way to deliver key messages than, let's say, a serious drama show? Absolutely. Norman Lear has a wonderful quote in an in interview. I think it's with the Television Academy where he, he describes comedy as being an intravenous way of introducing ideas or arguments or just exposure to different kinds of people that you're you're laughing you're having a great time when you're watching comedy if it's working and it's a way of of gently and kindly presenting something that might be unfamiliar or might not be welcome by welcomed by a certain segment of the audience laughter makes it so much easier to consider to consider a new idea because your your guard is down uh, and it's also a great way to relate to somebody you know laughter is something that all people do in in some form, some of us more than others, but we we all we all laugh. We all laugh at stuff. And often a joke can be laughed at by people who are from wildly different backgrounds, who hold wildly different principles. And suddenly, you know, it, it's it's a great way to understand your connection to somebody that you might not have appreciated before. So yeah, I think I think comedy, as much as we might think sitcoms are are a silly, disposable, fluffy light form of entertainment. I think that there is a reason that they are such a that sitcoms and comedy in particular is such a, a pervasive part of people's lives. It's something that people seek out uh, and always will. 
Now, Matt, as you know, in the early 70s, two episodes of Marcus Welby, MD, presented very negative and homophobic attitudes about gays. And other shows like Police Woman did the same thing. Did those shows help to mobilize gay activists to lobby the industry to eliminate homophobia on TV? Absolutely. Not many people remember these shows because they... Fortunately, did not have much of a life in uh, syndication. They, you know, shortly after they were broadcast, uh, there was a realization that it was unacceptable what what was being presented. So, what people saw in the broadcast uh, in one episode of Marcus Welby was a character who is gay, but he's counseled by his doctor on how to become straight. Marcus Welby, the doctor, says something like, uh, "You'll you'll never earn the respect of your son unless you can straighten yourself out." Something to, you know, words to those effect. On police women, uh, you saw a police woman. You saw a gang of killer lesbians present in a very offensive, stereotypical way. Uh, there's another episode of Marcus Welby where we see a young man who has been uh, abused by an older man, uh, as actually a boy who's been abused by an older man, uh, and it's presented as as something you know, it's linked to homosexuality in a way that's just you know, completely inaccurate and, and false. And so these things appeared on television. It was something that it was a presentation that really would not have been out of place just a few years earlier. But what's happening behind the scenes, and this is a lot of what I talk about in the book, is is the kind of the seldom told story about what was happening behind the scenes. With those episodes, there was greater organization of gay media activists, gay and lesbian media activists. They were able to network across the country. They were able to reach people inside the networks that they never had before. At the same time, there were closeted queer people inside the television industry who were slipping surreptitiously, slipping scripts uh, to these activists outside of the industry. Uh, and so sometimes television executives would find out that something appalling and offensive was about to be broadcast before they even knew it themselves. So when those episodes of Police Woman and, and Marcus Welby and some other you know shows that were really unacceptable were broadcast, Suddenly there was an opportunity because of that organizing that was happening in activist circles, there was an opportunity for them to march on the networks, make their voices heard. In fact, after that Marcus Welby episode, uh, a bunch of activists in New York from the Gay Activists Alliance went to the ABC headquarters and took over the offices. They sat in and they demanded that they be listened to, basically that we are we are a powerful block of people who have been ignored for so long and and we want that to change. The same thing happened with uh, Police Woman. There's a, a feminist, uh, lesbian feminist organization that took over, I believe it was NBC headquarters, and sat in there for days until until they were listened to. They unfurled a banner from a balcony at, at, at 30 Rockefeller Center. Uh, they brought their their kids with them. So there was, uh, you know, this experience of children sitting in the office with their lesbian mothers. It's something that, again, would have been unthinkable years earlier. And something that a lot of Americans and a lot of television executives probably hadn't occurred to them that this is a group of people who exist, uh, LGBTQ people with children, for example. And then these are decent, good people. So those bad episodes of television, as bad as they were, were a sort of inflection point where there was, there's sort of a, an opportunity to tell the networks exactly what was unacceptable about that presentation. Yes, I found the part of your book that referred to the Gay Media Task Force whose mandate was to seek to improve the depiction of queer characters on TV. I thought that was really, really fascinating because that organization actually had some real influence as you just explained. Yeah. You also wrote about a very unfortunate phenomenon in 1975 known as the Family Viewing Hour, mm -hmm. which was launched by the National Association of Broadcasters requiring that all TV shows that aired between 8 and 9 p.m. be free of sex, violence, or homosexuality. The court ultimately struck it down as unconstitutional. So my question to you, Matt, is this. Did that court ruling send a message not only to the TV networks, but to the public about the appropriateness of featuring gay characters on TV? Yeah, so the family viewing hour debacle, a fiasco, is so interesting. And gosh, we really, this country really dodged a bullet with that. And again, like a lot of credit is due to Norman Lear and also Larry Gelbart and Mary Tyler Moore and other people in the television industry who took a stand. Essentially, the National Association of Broadcasters, which was a kind of umbrella group for, for all the networks, uh, was pressured by the FCC, which uh, is the federal you know, agency that regulates broadcasters. Basically, they were pressured by the government to limit expression uh, of certain controversial themes. 
And it was just an unmitigated disaster and probably would not have lasted very long anyway because it was so unpleasant and difficult for the networks. But its demise was accelerated thanks to a lawsuit from Norman and some other people. You know, basically, and, and this judge found that this was uh, brought about through undue influence from from the government. It represented a government intrusion into into uh, on the First Amendment. So it was a, a great moment to reinforce that, no, the, the government can't say, the government can't push broadcasters to limit their, limit the expression of, of creatives in, in, in this, you know, heavy and so heavy handed a way. When the family viewing hour went away, it was a great time. It only lasted a year. It was a great time for an explosion, a proliferation of much more realistic depictions of the issues facing uh, Americans. Uh, I think that that court ruling was, there were a lot of ways that it could have gone wrong. And it essentially was the best possible outcome that that anyone could have hoped for. Oh, for sure. Now, of all the TV shows in the 70s that you wrote about, Matt, the one that really moved me the most in terms of making an important statement was the episode of Alice, where she refuses to let her son go on a fishing trip with a gay male friend of hers, and she ultimately changes her mind and lets him go. That issue about allowing gay people near children is one of the most toxic and poisonous aspects of homophobia that has taken generations to overcome, hasn't it? Yeah. And, you know, that episode of Alice is a brilliant refuting of what was behind the family viewing hour. So that episode features, it's early, early in the show's run too. I think it's very brave for the show to have tackled homosexuality as early as it did. So early in the show's run, uh, Alice, who's a single mom, meets a man who she becomes friendly with. They go on some, what she believes are dates. And then he comes out to her uh, and, you know, she realizes that they've been friends this whole time. Not, this is not going to become romantic. But then she starts to worry about allowing this man with whom she was very close friends just a moment earlier of allowing that man around her son. Even in, you know, social situations that are supervised with other people, you know, she's not talking about like leaving them alone together. Not that that would be a problem either. Anyway, you know, she, she has this concern about, oh gosh, should I allow my kid near near this gay guy? Meanwhile, this episode aired just after the end of the family viewing hour, which was brought about, you know, through a lot of rhetoric about like, oh, think of the children, think of the children. You know, we can't allow kids to understand, you know, to see that there are homosexuals in the world. It's it's not appropriate for, for families. Uh, you know, it suggests that there are no such thing as gay families, which obviously is not true. You're gay heads of household or, or gay parents or whatever. So Family Viewing Hour is just on its last legs at, at the time that this airs. And then you have this uh, episode with a with a beautiful message, this beautiful uh, episode of Alice where she considers her prejudice and realizes that it's wrong, that this guy is a friend. She trusts him. She trusted him a minute ago before she knew he was gay. What has changed now? And is she uh, relying on false stereotypes of queer people that have been fed to her, uh, uh, you know, and that she's just accepted unquestioningly? It's a really great illustration of why getting to know queer people, either in person or if that's not possible for whatever reason, through television characters, how that can change a person's frame of mind. And in the end, of, you know, in the end of this episode of Alice, she realizes, oh, wait, this is this is this is wrong what I'm doing, you know, judging this person based on what I've been told about him rather than recognizing what I can see right in front of me with my own two eyes, that this is a good guy. So it's it's a it's a really lovely episode. And then when she tells her son later that that this man is gay, of course, her son is like, oh, OK, no big deal. I, you know, that's always how it goes. We're like, oh, what do, what do I say to the kids? What do the children think? How do I communicate? How do I tell my children about gay people? Well, you just tell them and then they'll be like, all right, <laughs> it's no big deal. You wrote that Barney Miller was one of the most groundbreaking shows on TV when it came to queer representation. Why? There's a lot of great stuff happening with Barney Miller, both on screen and behind the scenes. So the first, I think it's it might be the second or third episode, but early in the first season, they introduce a gay character who's a, a, a purse snatcher, Marty, a, who's a fun character. He gets a lot of fun, silly lines, but also there's a little bit of stereotyping in the performance. And I think that behind the scenes, Danny Arnold, who's the creator of the show, recognized that. He brought in Newt Dieter, who is one of the uh, members of the Gay Media Task Force, a consultant on uh, episodes of uh, television like this, along with Ginny Vita and some other uh, some other folks. Anyway, so Barney Miller, the show, brought on Newt Dieter to consult on how they could make this character better. And really, to their credit, they did. 
they slowly over the course of the series, Marty becomes less and less of a, a punchline stereotype flamboyant purse snatcher and a more upstanding member of the community. He gets more depth. Uh, he gets a partner. We see them a long-term committed relationship that seems very close. Although of course they can't touch each other or express physical affection because you know these things take time. But uh, tel the television that this television show is able to show these characters is recurring that they were strong. And in the end, you know, they actually uh, have a son that they're sharing custody with with the uh, with a mother from a, a previous uh, heterosexual relationship. And it's it's honestly quite beautiful that that this gay character who started off as a punchline, the show, talked to queer people, listened to their concerns, and was able to incorporate that feedback uh, into a better and better and better representation. By the end, uh, they're, they're actually, this couple appears in the final episode of Barney Miller. There's not many characters who come back and recur in that final episode to say goodbye to everybody. And I think it's really meaningful that uh, the show decided, no, they are important enough. We want to have them there. I think so, too. You wrote a chapter about friends and the running mm -hmm. joke about people mistakenly thinking that Chandler was gay, but of course he wasn't. Do you think friends would have had the same success if one of the lead characters had been gay? That's such a great question. It's really hard to say. I think so. I think that there's a lot about friends that was uh, appealing to audiences at the time that I don't think Chandler being gay would have derailed. If anything, it would have given people a lot more reason to talk about the show when it, I mean, it, he would have been very unusual to have a gay character in the core cast uh, at that time. I think, believe it was like 94 or so when that premiered. This was, you know, before Ellen, before Will and Grace, before even like some occasional gay characters on shows like Roseanne. So to have a, actually, I think Roseanne did have some queer characters before that, but they certainly were not as prominent as Chandler would have been. So it was up for consideration for a long time that Chandler might be the gay character. And you can certainly see it in, especially in the pilot. There are a few little hints here and there. Uh, similarly with, uh, you know, the Mary Tyler Moore show, there was some consideration of making the Murray character gay. Ultimately, they didn't do that on Mary Tyler Moore. They didn't do that on Friends, but oh boy, oh boy, what, what it could have been if, if, if they'd really gone for it, they'd made Chandler gay. That having been said, uh, the, the handling of gay representation on Friends, I think, is something that doesn't always age well. Occasionally, we do see gay characters on the show. There's a lesbian wedding, which is very groundbreaking. I think it actually is presented very nicely. But often on Friends, just the mere fact of homosexuality is a punchline. It's something funny. Just to, to laugh at the fact that someone is gay seems like it's enough of a joke. I don't think it's done with malice, but I think every, every time it happens, which is not that often, but still it's, it's frequent enough that it's a pattern. Every time it happens, I kind of cringe and grit my teeth because I'm aware of what could have been there, that friends could have had uh, a more nuanced look at at queer people's lives. Now, sure. you know, and it's not all bad because they they do have some they do have some great moments. They have there's a lesbian kiss with Winona Ryder. I think you know that stuff is all very nice, but I, I think there are a lot of gaps in the way that Friends present things, particularly with the character of Chandler's parent, who is presented kind of inconsistently as sometimes a drag queen, sometimes a trans woman. It's somewhat hard to tell. There are jokes at that person's uh, at that person's expense, played by Kathleen Turner, who said that she wouldn't take the role now. People who worked on the show, uh, Marta Kaufman has said that they didn't know then what they know now about presenting trans characters and they, they would have done it differently. There, there, there are certainly those episodes that you're like, when I look at them, I say, well, could it could have been better. And there were people you could have asked. You could have done what Barney Miller was doing 20 years earlier and, and asked some trans people what they thought of this. Exactly. But exactly. live and learn. The chapter in your book about Ellen DeGeneres coming out in 1997, both in real life and on her sitcom, is yeah. really fascinating on so many levels, Matt. I have to say that although I applauded Ellen at the time for coming out, I ultimately found her show after the coming out episode to be disappointing because the mm -hmm. show became only about her being gay and the comedy was gone. It felt too much like we were being educated instead of being entertained. Do you agree? You know, I think it's really hard to judge from a modern perspective because 
you know, looking back on that show, something that I think helps to contextualize it is remembering that they were real. This was they were they were navigating. They were breaking new ground. There, there was really no roadmap to what they were doing. This was totally uncharted territory, what, what they were going through. And so it was hard. You know, now we've we've had Glee and Ugly Betty and Modern Family and Schitt's Creek and all these shows that have done a, a good job of, of determining how you have a main, like your, your named primary character be a queer person. And, you know, how how much is too much gay and how much is not enough? I, I think that when Ellen, you know, so Ellen comes out and then there's, that was actually going to be the original plan was that was going to be the final season. It was going to end with a few episodes of her being, uh, you know, a lesbian. And then we're going to, we're going to have a finale there. Uh, and it wasn't up to Ellen DeGeneres to uh, decide, you know, it was somebody else's decision about, you know, continuing the show for another season. Well, I think that they were a victim of uh, having a lot of chaos behind the scenes because there was a lot of turnover on the staff. There was a new producer that season. And also there was a lot of chaos at NBC, uh, at ABC, about how they were going to present all this content. So you can really see the push and pull of, you know, the, the door's been, we've pushed the door open. We've got a, we've got a lesbian main character now. It would be a waste of time to um, pretend that we didn't do that. Uh, we've got this opportunity to to have her be a lesbian and, and show what her life is like. Great, let's let's explore that. And I think a lot of people found it um, to be more than more than they wanted from the show. I, and I, I I think there there was a real learning opportunity there about how to have a queer character and also not make it feel to uh, mainstream audiences. Like the show is not for them anymore. I think that lesson was really learned well by Will and Grace, which came just a year later and made the show much more. Will and Grace, I think, was a lot more welcoming to to non-queer audiences without sacrificing all of the queerness that was, you know, that they had the potential to talk about there. You know, Will and Grace still, it took them a while to get up to a kiss, to a same-sex kiss, it took them a while to get the characters in relationships but, you know, you, you ease an audience into something like that and they're laughing at and before they realize that they're applauding and laughing for for queer characters who they might not have previously. Basically, you've you've appealed to them with a show like Will and Grace. You've, you've appealed to them through the comedy and through the humanity of the, the characters. And I think that that just wasn't something that shows had a great understanding of how to do at the time that Ellen entered its, I believe, fifth season uh, when it was all gay all the time. I want to ask you about Cheers, which I never thought was particularly groundbreaking, except for one episode featuring Harvey Firestein and one episode entitled The Boys in the Bar, which incidentally got an Emmy nomination and a Writers Guild Award. Do you think Cheers did much for gay visibility and acceptance? You know, I don't think Cheers did a ton, but again, you know, contextualizing the time, this is the 1980s. There's really a pulling back at that time of reflecting queer people on television. I think largely because uh, HIV uh, was seen as such a, a taboo and depressing and something that the entertainment industry just didn't know how to tackle for a long time. So I, I think that there wasn't a ton in the 80s, not a ton of queer people on screens. And the fact that Cheers was able to have any at all and devote an entire episode, like The Boys in the Bar, is a really great episode that lampoons homophobia and the, the panic that heterosexuals might feel. Oh, no, there might be a queer person in our midst. What a, what a crisis. What do we do about this? And in the end, you know, the, it's the, the homophobes or the people who are ignorant who are really made the butt of the joke. Uh, I think that's wonderful. Uh, and then there are little, uh, you know, moments of homosexuality sprinkled throughout the series. You also get Harvey Firestein, of course, who's just a hero uh, on uh, a later episode. So, uh, you know, a show like Cheers, one of the most, you know, popular shows on television, in television history, having queer characters here and there where they could, uh, I think is still very brave, very bold and, and very helpful. Uh, you know, they, I, I wouldn't say that they did a ton. Uh, Golden Girls, same thing. Uh, you know, that's a show that had a lot of queer people involved in the in the, the creation of it. They have queer characters peppered throughout. I think Golden Girls did had more and more relevant gay storylines, particularly with Blanche's brother who comes and visits and Blanche's brother is getting married in this beautiful episode. So anyway, I, I, I think that there are the shows at the time did what they could. 
they they pushed it as far as was possible at the time. Uh, and you know, and I certainly I'm not I'm not mad at Cheers for not having more gay characters. Could they have? Maybe, but again, remember, put in the context of the time, it wasn't easy. No, it wasn't. Now, I'm very glad that you mentioned Golden Girls. I love the way you described it as one of the luckiest accidents in television history. And of course, it was a monumental hit show. It had a huge gay audience. And as you've also said, the Golden Girls was on TV at the height of the AIDS epidemic when homophobia was rampant everywhere. Do you think that the Golden Girls helped reduce people's fear of being around gay men? Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's in particular, there's uh, two great episodes with the Blanche character's brother Clayton coming to visit, played by Monty Markham. So in one season, he comes to visit, he confesses to uh, Rose that he's gay, and she encourages him to come out to to Blanche, to his sister. Now, this is a woman from the South. She is conservative in many areas of her life, not all, obviously, but she's not somebody who welcomes the news that her brother is gay. And there's a lot of tension. And this is something that is real serious and realistic. I mean, particularly at the time for a family member to come out, particularly somebody who comes out at what we would call now late in life. Uh, you know, her, her brother appears to be in like his 50s or so. And so we see Blanche initially reject him. We see Clayton, the character, the brother character, take a very bold stance and say, this is who I am. If you don't like it, you're not a part of my life. And then her realizing, Blanche realizing by the end of the episode that they actually, they he's still the character. He, he's still the brother that she grew up with. She's He's still somebody that she loves uh, and she can grow to accept it. And then he comes back a season later. He's got a partner. He's going to get married. Once again, she has difficulty accepting it. There's a gorgeous speech that is less than a minute long, but there's this wonderful interaction that Blanche has with Sophia. Blanche just is struggling to accept the fact that her brother is in love and getting married to a man or having what at that time would have been a commitment ceremony to a man. And Sophia puts it in such beautiful terms. She says, well, why did you and George get married? Saying to Blanche, why did you and George get married? And Blanche says, well, we loved each other. We wanted to make a lifetime commitment and, and we wanted everyone to know about it. And Estelle, uh, Estelle Getty's character, Sophia says, that's what, that's what your brother wants too. Doesn't everybody deserve that opportunity? What a beautiful moment of, of connection and understanding. And that's all it takes to get Blanche to realize uh, that she's made a terrible mistake. There are a lot of other queer episodes of the show. And of course, all, you know, the women in the in the cast had uh, done a lot of activism for LGBTQ causes, especially Estelle Getty and, and B. Arthur after the Golden Girls. They, they were just incredible allies who raised money and were vocal and visible. And they're just absolute saints uh, in supporting the queer community at a very difficult, controversial time. So both on screen and behind the scenes, they just were uh, did so much good for for the queer community. Now, moving on to Will and Grace, which you've mentioned uh, mm -hmm. in this interview, but I just want to say to you, I, I distinctly remember that when Will and Grace first started, many of us in the gay community were not happy with the show because we felt Will was being unrealistically portrayed as practically celibate. And mm -hmm. the Sean Hayes character, Jack, was way too outrageously effeminate. And the network went to great trouble to let us all know that... Eric McCormick, who played Will, was straight. He was only acting. It took me a long time to warm up to Will and Grace. Did you feel the same way? When it was on, I actually appreciated it. I, and I did. I remember what you're, what you're describing, that discomfort over how it felt like the show really put gays at two ends of a spectrum. There was the successful relatively masculine macho will character there was the wildly flamboyant very energetic you know light in the loafers jack character and it felt like okay we're we're, we're just at two ends of a spectrum not to mention that these are both two cisgender white male characters and it's you know there's there's a much broader lgbtq community out there that's not even being represented at all here i remember at the time i was actually in college when it came on and i remember one of the professors was at Emerson College in Boston, wrote an essay for Bay Windows, which was the uh, the queer newspaper there. He wrote an essay about it uh, where he said, I, I remember feeling very conflicted about that, he, where he said something like, I can't believe how many of my friends are lying about not knowing people exactly like Will and Jack. 
And it, it's a good point that there are people like that. There are gay people like both of those. And I'm delighted to see, I look delighted to see queer anything on television. You know, I agree with Harvey Firestein. He says in, in the documentary, The Cellular Closet, he says that, that he comes down on the side of like, any, any representation is better than no representation. And I think Will and Grace had a really difficult job to do, especially after Ellen, the show Ellen's cancellation just a few months earlier. You know, it was such a challenge. A lot of people, when Will, when Will and Grace was premiering, all of the news coverage was essentially boiled down to how dare they? How dare they try to put gay characters on television again after, you know, viewers proved that they didn't want to see that with Ellen. So Will and Grace had such a difficult job to do to make the show appealing to to audiences so that they could get used to seeing gay characters on television in a way that 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 was that was fun and friendly. NBC did a lot of very difficult they had a difficult tightrope uh, in the early promos there's nothing about the show being gay. In fact, the early promos for Will and Grace present them as friends and suggest that they might actually hook up. It, it seems like a rom-com where Will and Grace are these star-crossed lovers who are eventually going to figure out that they love each other. And that was very deliberate. That was intentional. Uh, uh, James, James Burroughs, who directed every episode uh, of the show, said that they deliberately had a kiss in the pilot episode and in the season finale of season one to make you know middle america people who are in the mushy middle on the fence to make them think okay this might not be a, a gay show i might have heard that it's a gay show but maybe there's more going on here so they did some very clever framing uh, of the of the premise to get as many people in as they could and i think part of that was presenting archetypes the will archetype the jack archetype uh, it may seem very tiresome to queer audiences, but they got those characters out there so that they could push open the door, pave the way for more nuanced depictions, which is certainly what we saw in the years that followed, you know, Glee and Ugly Better and Schitt's Creek and, and, and all those that, that came later. When Joe Biden was vice president, he said that Will and Grace helped to educate the public to make same-sex marriage more acceptable. But I think Modern Family did much more. What do you think? You know, I think it depends on your audience. I think that those are shows that appeal to different crowds. You, you've got Will and Grace, you know, again, look at the time that it was on. It was at a time when public opinion about just whether queer people should have, I mean, not just equal rights, but whether it should be a crime for, for gay people to exist in public. It was still homosexuality, homosexual conduct, as they called it, was still illegal in a lot of states in the U.S. when Will and Grace premiered. And it, it was for many years afterwards. So I think that show did a lot to warm people up. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Modern Family, Mitchell and Cam on Modern Family, presenting a delightful, adorable gay couple who are raising a, a kid and presented it as completely equal, eventually, completely equal to the other members of the family. I, I think that that did a lot of great work as well, especially because Modern Family had an opportunity and this wonderful marriage episode. They had an episode, an opportunity to show uh, why gay, why same sex couples wanted to marry, why it was so important, and 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 what goes into, you know, a, a relationship. Why 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 their relationship is so strong. Uh, eventually, you know, it was just when uh, Prop Eight was overturned, the marriage ban was overturned in California. They were able to essentially incorporate that legalization, that legal recognition, into the show with this beautiful episode where they're, you know, just struggling to get to the altar. First of all, there's the beautiful uh, proposal episode where they're both trying to one up each other with proposals, and always it's hilariously going wrong. And then they have this moment, you know, the gay couple has this moment of connection. I think what Modern Family did that was so brilliant was showing parallels between different family structures. So you have this blended family, you've got a same-sex couple, you've got a more traditional husband and wife, uh, heterosexuals, you've got people who are remarried, multi, um, you know, multicultural families, and you see, you know, no matter what the family makeup, at, at foundationally, these are uh, folks who love each other and you know, juxtaposing the gay couple with with the other folks really drives home the 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 loveliness and the relatability of of queer folks. So by the time they're walking down the aisle, audiences have gotten to know them for for several years on Modern Family, and we see them kiss at this this golf course at, at the you know the season finale of, of Modern Family when when Cam and Mitch finally get married. They have this beautiful ceremony with these lovely vows, 
and they kiss on a golf course. It's actually a Donald Trump owned golf course where they shot it. And, uh, you know, it's uh, you can just you can just feel an audience cheering for them, an audience that might have been on the fence just a few years earlier might have said, well, I, you know, I'm sure they're lovely, but why, why can't they just get civil married or civil unioned? Why do they have to get married? Well, I, I think Modern Family did a great job of answering that question. Oh, absolutely. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Matt Baum by going to his official website, mattbaum.com. You can also follow him on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to his YouTube channel, which brilliantly points out iconic comedy moments that mark real life civil rights milestones. Well, Matt, I have only one more question for you. Now that there are hundreds of TV channels, streaming platforms, independent media sources, are you more confident than you used to be that a positive LGBTQ presence in mainstream entertainment is a sure thing? Or do you worry that there could be a backlash? I wish I could answer that more positively. It's great that we have so many options for entertainment. And, it, you know, between social media and the explosion of streaming services, we've got more options than ever. But a consequence of that very good thing is that audiences can now become much more fractured and fragmented. And so instead of a situation where, for example, soap comes on the air and suddenly two, 20 million Americans are seeing a gay character, now... We, you know, you've got a, a gay character on this show or that show or, you know, and, and, you know, there's so many television programs that I've never even heard of at this point because it's on some streaming service that I'm like, oh, I have to get a membership to this now. So, you know, there's a real struggle to 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 accomplish the good that was done by shows like Friends and Will and Grace and the Golden Girls and all those. It's just not possible to reach that many people with a single program. So I think that our gains are very precarious. Uh, I think it's something that we're seeing right now in terms of legislation that is in particular targeting transgender folks. But I think, you know, absolutely trans people need to be defended and, and their rights absolutely need to be stood up for. And we need to have trans people on in entertainment and we need to have trans people represented in government and at every level. And I think that that is they are on the leading edge of a backlash that has been building and building and building for the last 20 years. Something that I've noticed in looking at media history is that it always comes in waves. There's a rise in queer representation and then a sharp backlash and a drop off and a rise and a drop off. And usually those waves are pretty compact. Usually they're small ups and downs. Well, we've been having... Mm -hmm. A great time for the last two decades. Things have been going great. They've been going our way. It's been getting better and better and better for the last 20 years. And I think there is some real bad news just around the corner unless, and, and this is what we have to do. This is what's crucial. Unless we look at what worked in the past and we work deliberately and intentionally to protect those advances. That means standing up for marginalized groups, particularly trans people right now. Uh, it means putting pressure on uh, media gatekeepers to continue just as the Gay Activist Alliance and Gay Media Task Force were doing in the 1970s. We need to keep that work up just as GLAAD has been doing for the last 50 or so years. We need to keep that work going. Uh, and also queer people in the entertainment industry, even when it's unpopular, have got to stick up for representing their people. They've got to stick up, not just queer people, but queer people and their allies uh, have got to recognize there will sometimes be difficult fights and you got to fight to do what is essentially to do what is right uh, and put queer people in entertainment, get in front of people. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, uh, for example, I'm, I'm just working on a project right now about the made for TV movie that certain summer, which aired in 1972, early made for TV movie depicting a same sex couple starring Martin Sheen and Hal Holbrook nearly didn't make it to air. And it got on the air because there was one executive at ABC who was willing to fight for it. Uh, Barry Diller, who's a complex person, but he was the head of entertainment at ABC at the time. He knew that the network was not going to want to have a gay couple on their, you know, their flagship ABC movie of the week, you know, product. He fought tooth and nail to defend that product. He defended it from the censors who wanted to take out all the gay stuff. They wanted to, you know, put in all this stuff to, to, to denigrate queer people uh, in, in this made for TV movie. And he used his clout to stand up for, for what was right. It's something that's not easy to do. When, I know when you're in the belly of the beast, there's a lot of temptation. It's very beguiling to go along with the way the prevailing winds are blowing. But we will lose a lot of advances unless folks are willing to stand up in the industry 
unless folks are willing to stand up and, and make a lot of noise and be a, be a pain in the neck <laughs> as activists uh, and as viewers to register your support for that content and speak out and, and be vocal about that. Well, amen to that. I couldn't agree more. I, I've really enjoyed having you on the show, Matt, because your book didn't just give us insights into what was really going on behind the scenes in so many of our favorite TV shows, but the book is a kind of a blueprint for helping us move into the future in the entertainment world, learning about the mistakes, learning about what worked and what didn't. It's a fascinating book. I recommend it highly to all our viewers. Thank you so much for writing the book and for taking the time to appear on our show. Absolutely. Thanks again so much for having me. Yeah. And, and folks can check out the book if you go to gaysitcoms.com. Uh, Hi, honey, I'm homo is the title. Uh, so it's at gaysitcoms.com. Our guest has been Matt Baum, whose new book, Hi, Honey, I'm Homo, is now available wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.